you know, go ahead and mark your calendars for two things. One of them is on October 27th, our own Jessica Eaton is going to be offering a piano recital here at the church. And so please be on the lookout. We'll be giving information out about that, but know that on that evening she's going to be offering a, a special recital. And then on November 13th, I want y'all to take a moment and everyone bring your eyes up to me. Y'all are going to get this announcement for the, for the next several weeks. On November the 13th, our bishop will be coming to Duncan and leading us in worship. That is quite, quite a special occasion. And so uh, we are going to have a full service of worship followed by um, a church meal. And as I look at you all, I will see you on November the 13th <laughs> when our bishop is here with us. Uh, but do let, let others know, be, be passing that information on. That is a, a high honor for us to have our bishop come and lead us in worship. And we very much look forward to having him with us on that day. Um, and lastly, I do want to point out that the Lula Ford Circle will be meeting, and I want to make sure I get the times right. Lula Ford meets on Tuesdays, and it's in the evening? Morning. It's in the morning. Okay, it is at what time? 10 o'clock? 1030. 10.30 this Tuesday. This is why I ask questions. But this Tuesday in particular, I think they have a special guest coming to speak with them from, is it St. Francis Animal Rescue? Is that, is that right? So we do encourage you to come and be a part of that conversation as they welcome St. Francis and come to, to lead them in that time. Um, friends, with all that, let us now direct our hearts and mind toward God as we enter into this time of worship. Good morning. Our opening hymn is 152, I Sing the Almighty Power of God.
You'll find our opening prayer in our bulletin. I'll invite you to join me in praying it. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you for your Spirit through whom we are given the gift of renewal. Renew in the whole church that passionate desire for the coming of your kingdom, which will unite all Christians in one mission to the world. May we all grow up together into him who is our head, the Savior of the world. Amen. may be seated. And Cassie Joe, why don't you come on up? And children, y'all come and join her as she has a special message for you all today. It's good to see everyone's face that we made it through, but we continue to pray for those who are less, we're less fortunate than we were during this hurricane time. All right. What do I got? have up here, guys? Keys. You guys are good. I got keys, right? What kind of keys do I have? Can you guys car think? Keys. My keys, car keys, and Sarah's. Because she has the pink ring. That's right. These keys unlock a lot of things, like our houses. Me and Sarah have keys to go to a lot of the doors here on campus. So they unlock a lot of important things. What are some other keys that unlock things? Yeah. Uh, jewelry, box. jewelry box. That's important. Yeah. Your home. If your, locked. if your door is locked, you have to unlock it. Yes, Nico. You have to open them. And yes, Mac. A treasure, a treasure box. That's right. Well, listen, I want to talk to you about another key. And this key we may not think about a lot, but it's a pretty important key. And it's called faith, right? You? It's called faith. And that key is so important because guess what it unlocks? Our faith unlocks the power of God. And if we, I know. And if we use that faith, it's going to unlock the power of God and he's going to move into our lives and do mighty things. Can you guys say mighty things? Mighty things. God's power. God's power. Can do mighty things. And you guys, I know most of you know this song and I want you to repeat after me. My God is so big. My God is so big. So strong. So strong. And mighty. And mighty. There's nothing my God can't do. Amen. Can we say an amen to that? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father God, please remind us this morning of your wonderful faith that would unlock your power to move into our lives. God, help us focus on that because you are mighty and you are big and there's nothing you cannot do. Amen? Amen. amen. All right, let's get next door so we can have fun at Kids Church. Let's go. I invite you to stand for our Psalter reading, which we will read responsibly. comes from Psalm 137, and you'll find that in the hymnal on number 852.
by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. For there are captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue bleed to the root of my mouth, if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. O Lord, remember against the Edomites the day of Jerusalem. O daughter of Babylon, you devastator, happy shall they be who repay you with what you have done to us. Happy shall they be to take your little ones and dash them This is the word of the Lord. You You may be seated. Our first lesson comes from Lamentations. We'll be reading the first six verses of chapter one. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She that was great among the nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, she has no one to comfort her. All of her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to the festivals, and all her gates are desolate. Her her priests groan, her young girls grieve, and her lot is better. Her foes have become the masters and her enemies prosper because the Lord has made her suffer for the multitude of her transgressions. Her children have gone away, captives before the foe. From daughter Zion has departed all her majesty and her her princes have become like stags that find no pasture. They fled without strength before the pursuer. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Certainly this morning we are mindful of those uh, most affected by the storm um, that we have recently been through. And we remember them in our prayers, both here locally and in Florida and other parts of our country. Um, Are there any other prayer requests that you would like to lift up today? The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Most gracious God, we do give you thanks for the calmness of this day. As we have come through an unexpected storm, we are mindful of your presence in the midst of what we experienced. For only a week ago, we were here giving thanks to you and seeking the direction of your Holy Spirit, unaware of the full effect that Ian would have upon our coast and on our community. And even though we've been through what we would consider inconvenient, frustrating, 
we do give you thanks that there were no deaths and that no life was lost here locally. Lord, we know that there are those in our community who have been directly affected, most so by way of the surge. And we pray in this time of rebuilding and cleaning that you will be with them and that you will use each of us as you would so choose to lend a hand to our neighbor that we might work mutually with one another to help each other get to the place where you've called us to be. For just as we offer and ask this prayer during a time of storm, we ask the same in this life of faith. That you, by the strength of your Holy Spirit, would empower each one of us to support one another as we seek to grow closer to you by growing closer to your Son. The truth is, O oh God, is, is that it's too easy for us to do harm intentionally and accidentally, that it's too easy to do harm to others. And so we do ask that you would forgive us for those transgressions that we have committed against our neighbor and against one another. And also, Lord, we acknowledge before you how difficult it is to extend forgiveness to those who have harmed us. So give us the strength this day to extend forgiveness to those who have brought harm upon us and upon our community. And as we come together and we read your word, may you work in and through each of us. May we receive your grace through your word and through this meal that sits before us. So that as we go forward from this place today, we may live the truth of your love before others. For do you ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, he who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The line is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you now to continue in this time of worship through the giving of your tithes and your offerings.
Most gracious God, we do give thanks to you for these gifts and all of our blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. I invite you to stand now in honor of the reading of the gospel. 
Our lesson comes from the 17th chapter of Luke. Now Jesus said to his disciples, Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to anyone by whom they come. It would be better for you if a millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea than for you to cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If another disciple sins, you must rebuke the offender. And if there is repentance, you must forgive. And if the same person sins against you seven times a day and turns back to you seven times and says, I repent, well, you must forgive. The apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord replied, If you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now who among you would say to your slave, who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, who would say, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper for me, put on your apron, and serve me while I eat and drink, and later you may eat and drink. Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. You know, sometimes it's the most basic of responsibilities that can be the most frustrating or even cause the most fear. I'm curious, show of hands, how many of you enjoy cleaning the kitchen? I would have thought at least a couple. Just Dupree. No. I'm going to be very careful in how I phrase this because I don't want this to result in a new chore for me. But for the most part, I don't, I don't object to cleaning the kitchen. I don't, you know, it's not, it's tolerable. I'll say that. For the most part, cleaning the kitchen is tolerable. But I will admit that there is one particular thing that frustrates me to no end. And Jenny can tell you, what is that one thing? The dishwasher. I cannot stand unloading the dishwasher. And I know why. And even though I know why, I can't reconcile. When I was a child and a teenager, after dinner every night, it was our job, my sister and I, we had the responsibility of returning the kitchen to working order. And so that included clearing the table and wiping all the countertops down. We had to clean out the pots and pans and put them away. And we had to take the dishes that were dirty and we had to put them into the dishwasher. But of course that meant that the dishwasher had to be emptied. And it seemed that every single night that dishwasher was full. And in my recollection, I don't know if my sister is watching, she might recall differently, but I remember being the one who was responsible for unloading the dishwasher. And so to this day, I cannot unload the dishwasher without acting like a frustrated teenager. <laughs> and Jenny will tell you, it is very evident when I'm unloading the dishwasher that I'm pouty and I'm in a mood and it's just like bringing back this old remembrance. It's the smallest of things sometimes, the most basic of things the most basic of responsibilities that can be the cause to our frustration and even to our fears. And I think the, tra the same is true even within the Christian life. It's often the most basic responsibilities, the most basic expectations of us as Christians that can be our greatest challenge. In our lesson today, we hear a request 
of the apostles. It's not just the disciples, the crowd of people who are around Jesus, but specifically the twelve. They make a request of Jesus. They say, increase our faith. Another way of saying that is, give us faith or give us more faith. And it's a very interesting request that these men make because it's one that we've probably made of Jesus at some point in our Christian life as well. At this particular point, Jesus has a crowd of people around him. Included in that crowd is that same group of Pharisees who he's previously addressed that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. But now he's turned his attention, not just to his disciples, but specifically to a few. And he begins to offer them an instruction. And we know that it is an instruction that is very important because Jesus brings emphasis upon his instruction in verse 3 when he says, Be on guard. Be on guard. As if to say, what I'm saying is not minor. What I'm asking of you, actually what I'm expecting of you, really does matter. And there's two instructions, one on either side of that call to being alert. And the first one is simply to do no harm. His request of his followers is that they should not be the ones who calls another member of the community of faith to stumble. That they ought not to be the one that prevents another individual from growing in their faith or for continuing in their spiritual walk. The truth is that all of us are at this different place within our relationship with God. And those who are new to the faith or those who are still immature in the faith, they look to those who precede them for guidance and instruction and encouragement. And he's looking to his disciples and he's saying, you better not take one of these little ones and lead them astray or disrupt the growth that is happening by way of the Spirit. You better not be the reason that their relationship with me becomes distorted. In the simplest of terms, do not harm them. Then on the other side of that, he offers another instruction. And in the simplest of terms, what he's saying is, forgive those who harm you. He uses the instruction of first saying, if you find a member of the community of faith, another disciple who is living in a wayward manner, moving away from a right relationship with God, bring that to their recollection. Bring it to their forefront. Rebuke them in a kind way. Rebuke them in a way that leads to repentance, which is the overall act of forgiveness. Bring them back into that place. But don't just bring them back into the place of forgiveness from God. You too must pardon them. And in both of these instances, he uses Uh, kind of a hyperbolic expression to kind of reinforce the significance of his teaching. Now, if you read the Bible literally, then it really does literally mean if you're going to call someone to stumble, then it's better for you to take a millstone and go jump in the ocean. But I would say that if you read it more from the sense of what Jesus is trying to say here is this really does matter. It would be better for you to harm yourself in your relationship with God than to prevent someone else. And in the other way, he says, forgiveness matters too. If someone were to sin seven times a day and repent seven times a day, you are to forgive them seven times. It's a really difficult teaching when you boil it down. And when you combine them together, because what Jesus is instructing his disciples to do and calling them to do 
is they are not to do harm to others, but they are always to forgive those who have harmed them. Do no harm to others, but readily and willingly forgive those who have harmed you. And when we think of it in those terms, it's no wonder that the disciples respond with a request of their own saying, we need some more faith, Jesus. Because what you're asking is not easy. It's not easily done to not cause harm to another person. Incidentally, intentionally, I mean, or accidentally, there are instances every day where our actions have an effect on someone else. And it is not an easy thing for us to do to live perfectly in a way that does not prevent someone from experiencing the fullness of God's love for them. It's not an easy thing to do. And if that's not an easy thing to do, it is most certainly not an easy thing to do to forgive someone who has harmed us. And that's what Jesus has brought in as his instruction to his disciples. What does it mean to be a follower of mine? It means for you to set out on a daily basis to seek not just doing good, but doing no harm and forgiving willingly those who have brought harm upon you or upon our community or upon the kingdom of God itself. So Jenny is very understanding. She knows that I get frustrated. She knows that I do not enjoy unloading the dishwasher. And about 98% of the time, she will take that responsibility on. But there are a few times, every so often, where I'll try to get some brownie points. And I'll go in and I'll unload the dishwasher. And I'll put them back and I order everything. And then I just kind of wait back for her to come in and see what I've done. And I just kind of stand off to the side all proud of myself. And she looks at me and she says, what, you want a cookie? <laughs> That's our fun little expression that we have for one another when, when one of us has done something that is so basic and yet we think that it's extra and we want that extra pat on the back for doing good. And she'll look at me and say, you want a cookie? Unloading the dishwasher is not extra. It's one of the most basic responsibilities to cleaning a kitchen. You don't get a pat on the back for doing the basic. It's expected of you. You see, the problem is that we live in a culture of extra. It's all around us. Basic is not acceptable anymore. We don't want to be basic. We don't want to, we don't want basic. We don't want to be basic. We don't want to think basic. We, nothing about basic can be okay. We want to be extra. We want to live extra. We want to act extra. We want extra. That's the culture that is feeding into us on a daily basis. And since basic is unacceptable, we want to think that everything we do is also extra. And we should be rewarded with extra for the extra we think we do when in reality it's basic. It's a basic responsibility. It's a basic expectation. It is a basic thing that we do as responsible adults and also Christians. It applies to our faith life as well. And that's how Jesus responds to his disciples when they ask this request of extra faith. 
he says, the smallest amount of faith is sufficient. Any amount of faith really is all you need because faith comes from the same source. It comes from the power of God. And he goes on to say in that same hyperbolic voice, do you not realize that even if you had the faith of a mustard seed that you could say to that mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would be done, which is to say even the smallest amount of faith, because it comes from the power of God, is greater than anything else that we could ever do or ever be, is more than enough. But he doesn't leave it there. He goes on and he uses this parable, and I'm not going to go deep into it. I just want you to understand it. It's what he said in verses 7 through 10 when he's talking about this relationship between a slave and the slave's master, and he does it to make a simple point that a disciple should not expect to receive a reward for fulfilling their Christian duties. They should not expect to receive extra for completing the basic. The disciples asked for greater faith upon hearing this instruction. And in reality, what they've asked for greater faith in is the ability to fill the basic responsibilities of a Christian. Do not harm others so as not to prevent them from growing closer to God. And willingly and readily forgive those who have brought harm to you and to our community. And it added to that is, don't think you need extra to complete this basic thing. Because any amount of faith is strong enough, is strong enough for you to live out a life of faithfulness. Yes, we do live in a culture of extra. When we give ourselves over to this culture of extra, though, we fail to remember that Jesus has called us to the most basic of responsibilities of doing no harm to ourselves, to, our, uh, to others, to our community of faith, and to forgive the harm that others have done to themselves or to us or to our community. There is no need for extra. There really is no need for extra. When we are a part of Christ's body, when we have been blessed with the gift of faith through Jesus Christ, when we are blessed with that, we are incorporated, initiated, not only into the body of Christ, but into this good and great thing that God is still doing in our midst. That's our blessing, to be a part of, of that body that is still in motion and still at work. So my friends, my question for you today is what motivates you? What motivates your participation in a life of faith? When you walk away from this place and when you are, are working through that within yourself of, of saying, what does it mean to live out my faith before others? What motivates you? And what motivates your participation here amongst this community of faith? Are you seeking to fulfill the call that Jesus has placed upon all of us as his disciples? Or are you doing extra in your eyes? in the hopes of gaining something extra in some way. Because how we live out our faith matters. It's not extra. Living out our faith, that's just a basic responsibility. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, I'd like to invite you to stand and join me as we Respond this morning through the affirmation of our faith through the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. You can find that in the hymnal on number 881 if you need the words. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, And I invite you to turn in your hymnal. Am I right? Is it number 13? As we prepare for the sacrament of Holy Communion. This morning is World Communion Sunday. And so our liturgy for the day will be a little bit different. But your responses will be the same. So you can just follow along in the hymnal number 13, right? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, for you have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. For holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And he commissioned us to be his witnesses to the ends of the earth and to make disciples of all nations. And today his family and all the world is joining at his holy table. Now on the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread he gave thanks to you, O God. He broke the bread. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks to you. He gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Most gracious God, do pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. And renew our communion with your church universal throughout the world. Strengthen it in every nation and among every people to witness faithfully in your name. And by your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Amen. This is the body of Christ. Broken that we might be made whole. This is the blood of Christ shed for us for the forgiveness of sin. I'd like to remind you that this is not my table. This is not Duncan's table, nor is this the table of the Methodist Church. This is the table of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for that reason... All are welcome to this table who earnestly repent of their sin and desire to be in relationship with God by way of faith in his Son. We will be...
participating in this sacrament of communion through the way of intinction. Uh, the ushers will invite you to come forward after our choir comes through. Uh, you're welcome to take a piece of the bread and place it into the juice. Uh, following the reception of these elements, you're welcome to kneel for a time of prayer or return to your pew for a time of prayer. If you are unable to come forward and would like to receive communion, just let your usher know and they'll tell me and I can bring the elements to you. With all that in mind, come, this table is open.
In your hymnal, page 85, we believe in one true God. Made whole by his body and forgiven by his blood, go forth this day in the confidence of Jesus' love for each of you and make that known to others in the world. Amen.